uh, August 13th meeting of the CDA. I'll please come to order. You want to take roll call, please? Uh, yep. Uh, Wayne Clark. Yes. Karen Gale. Gerald Motter. Here. Jason Metz. Here. Donald Niemer. Here. Mickey Shapleski. Here. Kevin Haas. Here. All right. We have a quorum. Thank you. Anyone? Can we have a, a minute up? Okay. <laughs> you beat me. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Minutes stand approve of a previous meeting. Anyone? Well, do you want to hold two, three, five, and six for a closed session? Yes, sir. Uh, all right. Well, it, I just want to, we can do whatever you'd like, but um, we just went through them all and open. Oh, and yes. Then, we, we're going to, go we're going to touch on each of these so that we can explain everything that's open to the public. And then what we can't, then we'll go into closed session and complete that. All right. So item number two, discussion in regards to Mandel Group progress in the West Development located at 6774 West National Avenue and proposed South National Avenue Sova Development at 6600 West National Avenue Tax Key number 454-0649-00 and 454-0648-00. And four five four dash zero six five zero dash zero zero. Mr. Stevel. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, in the future, I'm going to have our clerical staff get rid of the tax key numbers. I okay. Think for, for discussion purposes, uh, the uh, they are in the development agreement. Uh, okay, we'll do that. Uh, today we have Bob Monnet, uh, President of Mandel uh, Group, uh, to talk about uh, Sona and where, where they're at and where they're headed. And with that, I'll let Bob introduce Bob and have a few Yeah, colleagues. thank you. And uh, you guys all made the right decision. You're on the right side of the <laughs> table tonight. <laughs> so I'm gonna go over here, if that's okay. Right. Before I do, I'd like to introduce uh, Elizabeth Adler, who's with me, one of our uh, key development associates who uh, is working with me on, uh, on this project. And, uh, and uh, what I wanted to do tonight, and do I, uh, can I just take the yep. control, is this, the steering wheel and off we go, mm -hmm. thank you. So um, last, last, last time we were here, um, we asked for an opportunity just to just come back and talk to you guys, folks, about where we're at, what's going on, what's happened, where are we going. So in the context of all that, we have some very specific things to talk about tonight regarding what's known as SONA, which stands for South of National. Um, and how that fits into the context of the overall plan for the uh, market. Um, so uh, if you remember back in uh, early 2016, you guys had an RFP process. We came in, we talked about how we wanted to create a food cluster, how we wanted to create that urban destination here, create a new neighborhood here. We showed you a bunch of images of the kind of excitement that we've been able to create elsewhere. Um, in and around our projects, and we wanted to do the same thing here. We had a plan that we presented, which was a four-phase plan. There was a office uh, part of the plan, office commercial part of the plan. There was a two-phase housing project proposed, and then there was a uh, and then there was a commercial cluster, uh, which was to become our food cluster, <clears throat> with the idea that what we were trying to do is take this hundred-year-old farmers market and give it. Uh, a, not only a lot of new life, give it new meaning, and give it a bunch of new uh, a vitality. It was it, we felt that the farmers market could become West Dallas's um, outdoor living room, and in fact, slowly but surely, that's been happening. A lot of that's been happening because of efforts from uh, from city staff. A lot of it's been happening uh, because of efforts by people like Mark Lutz. Um, we've been contributing to whatever. Uh, events are happening out there monetarily to help promote them and, and the like. And uh, so, um, so the idea was is to create some additional presence for the farmer's market and really make that a regional draw for people uh, to, to think of when they say, where are we going to go tonight? Where are we going to go this weekend? Hey, let's go to West Dallas. There's this great food cluster. There's these restaurants. There's all this stuff going on at the farmer's market. That's the kind of energy and excitement that we think the farmer's market has the potential to create. So this was the schedule that was concluded in our submittal. 
So we said that uh, in 2016, uh, we would we would be selected. We try to get a groundbreaking by that by the end of that year, and there was a lot of emphasis on getting the food cluster part of the development up front, and then begin some of the housing as well. And you can see the progression: commercial office opens, second phase of residential opens, etc. And so that was the so the process that we had was that we wanted to start with. Uh, we wanted to start with this stuff over here, the food cluster, and start with part of the housing and part of the office space. That was the intended uh, pathway of, of, um, of, uh, of our development plan. And then a few things happened along the way. Um, one thing that happened is that a number of people that had expressed key interest early on said, ah, you know what, we're not coming after all. So, uh, so Jim McCabe, Milwaukee Brewing Company, made a lot of noise about coming down here, creating a major facility down here. He ended up going to the Pabst Brewery downtown. So he didn't. He submitted a letter of interest, but he just didn't come. Um, the next thing that happened was El Rey, um, who was going to be our specialty market uh, anchor for the food for the food cluster. Um, we went, we went to the table with them three different times. Um, and, uh, and each time they had assigned something to come down here, they said, uh, we're just not comfortable with it. Well, what was happening was in the grocery space, there was a huge amount of turbulence in the grocery space, a lot of consolidation, and the writing's kind of on the wall when Sendix builds a new building and closes it within about a year of opening the building because the food and grocery space was just totally saturated in Milwaukee. And so, um, so we, we spent a whole lot of time talking to a whole lot of people. We had people lined up that said, you get the food open, we'll open, so-called co-tenanting agreements. Without a food store, there was, there was nothing. We went so far as in working with John and his team we made Fresh Time Farmer's Market the deal of the century. It, 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 there's no grocer that should have said, no, I won't do that. Um, they had previously committed to the 84 South development because they wanted interstate access to their store in Greenfield. Their final conclusion after saying, we want to go ahead and do this, they called back and they said, we decided that we're going to cannibalize the store at 84 South, which we said, you're not going to cannibalize the store at 84 South. And they were so convinced they were going to, they said, we're not, we can't move forward with you in West Dallas. So we scoured the market for food stores to anchor this thing. No one showed up. So, uh, so we had a shift. We can't just sit around and wait for people to show up. You know, we're sitting here trying to corral and uh, it's like herding cats trying to corral restaurants and the like to come in. The restaurants aren't the lead, restaurants are the followers. The lead was this anchor tenant. So, so we had a we had a we had to kind of re re uh, uh, reset ourselves, um, and so a lot of time in that first uh, six or eight months was time that didn't bear fruit. But in the meanwhile, we finally got Aurora uh, about after about twelve months of negotiation. We finally got Aurora to sign a lease in July of seventeen. So that ended up by July of seventeen, uh, two years ago. We said, okay, now we can go. Now we can progress. And um, we needed to get the Aurora lease signed and get them to agree to a site development plan because if we started something and didn't leave enough room for them, didn't have enough parking, we didn't want to, we didn't want to compromise the Aurora transaction, which was always seen by all of us as being a great anchor for this development and a great piece of, uh, of tax increment for the project. So um, the Aurora lease was signed in, the, in uh, July the final development agreement uh, was signed in December, uh, five months later, which uh, uh, we had started some work on it, but the, uh, the, the public-private development agreement between the city and Mandel was signed in December, and off we went on Aurora, and uh, we built like a bat out of hell then to get Aurora in there. Um, housing negotiations then commenced at that point to get the next piece going for the housing, um, and you'll see what happens. We moved to 2018. And actually, we, we turned the building over to Aurora in May of 2018 for them to start their interior improvements, and they got their clinic open at the end of 18, which is really close to where we were in the first place. So we got Aurora done. 
we then decided that because Sona wasn't uh, moving forward very quickly uh, and we were still having problems uh, without having an anchor tenant on the food side, we just didn't have the right formula on Sona. So we said, let's accelerate both phases of housing and do it all at once. So instead of doing phase one and then following with phase two, we said, we're going to build all of the housing at once uh, as a single phase. And then we're going to reset the planning for Sona and figure this Sona thing out. And we're going to talk about Sona uh, tonight in more detail. So fast forward to today, the housing's going to open in a few months here. Uh, we're going to be looking for your input on the redesign of Sona. Um, we have since gone out and uh, something else you're going to be talking about this morning. When the Kearney Trekker building came up, we said, we know a developer that is going to put West Dallas on the map with that project. So we went down to Chicago and, uh, and we, uh, we marketed the project and, and solicited Baum Revision to come uh, and get involved in the project. They, have, they were on the throes of completing a very similar project in Madison called Garver Feed Mills. They had expertise in food and event space. It was a perfect fit for them. You've seen their plans and I'm sure you have a conversation on them later. So our goal is to get that, we, we, we are hopeful that you move forward with them because it sets up the entire area, the entire neighborhood with a landmark building uh, that, um, that really is gonna be put to the appropriate use. And our goal is to start Sona this year, later this year, assuming we can all move together on it. Um, and then we get to 2020 um, and we have, um, we have other parts of, you know, we wanna see Sona get open. We wanna start the last building on the Sona site and if we're if we're if we have good success on leasing up our phase one phase two housing um, we actually have a two building cluster where we would plan on adding another 160 or so housing units um, on the other side of the street so we'll show you the plan for that uh, in a moment so to date to date we've committed 49 million dollars of investment since the time we started construction we've been investing about two and a quarter million dollars a month in West Dallas, it annualized $27 million a year. We're in, we're all in. And we are not gonna stop until we finish this project. Um, next up, we have the, the Sona food cluster. Um, there's a public, uh, pu there's a, a farmer's market public parking that we're discussing with staff right now that would be accommodated on the same block so that all that parking that's currently used by the farmer's market clientele there's still parking there in the future for people to park somewhere. The last thing we want to do is throw the baby out with the bathwater, take away all the parking that the farmer's market relies on and develop all that site. And then everybody has no place. There's no place to park for the farmer's market. That'd be pretty silly. So, um, so we have that incorporated in the plan. We then have a mixed use building on Sona and this additional phase four housing. Um, and so when all that is done, um, as compared to our original plan that we presented a few years ago where we said we thought there was a $67 million investment. What we're looking at all in is about a $91 million investment in West Dallas. So, um, so we see the opportunity now that we've pivoted on this food issue, which really is ironically, the food issue is the lowest value issue of the whole project. And it's the one we all talk about. But it is, it is not the one, it's the one that's necessary to create a level of excitement but it does not, retail space, food and beverage space does not create a whole lot of tax increment. So we're anxious to get these other buildings done. Um, and here's the way it all fits together. So at the top of the page, here's the, um, here's the, uh, the yellow uh, shades are commercial space, the blue shades are housing. So this building is up and it's been occupied and is, is uh, hopefully fully assessed at this point because we all want Aurora to pay their real estate taxes. I'm sure they wanna pay them as well. This is both phases of the housing being delivered here on this block uh, north of uh, uh, on, on the, Nona, the balance of the Nona site. So this property line between Aurora and housing, until the Aurora lease was signed, that line couldn't be set. Uh, the, the, you know, where we started with Aurora was they were gonna pull up a semi outside with an MRI machine in and stuff. And we ended up with a, basically a state-of-the-art clinic. So part of what we did was we helped move them into a space where they provided us with a higher quality building than they had first promised. We thought that was important for the image of the project overall. Um, so now we move down onto the Sona block, which is this block right here. 
And the idea is um, there were three parts of the, of the cost that we showed you. This right here is the food cluster coming down adjacent to the West Dallas Farmer's Market. The food cluster is comprised of individual food producer vendor retailers. So take, for instance, um, a baker who would be do, having, doing commercial bakery but having some kind of a bakery shop, pastry shop, pastry cafe out front. Uh, a coffee roaster, grinder, packager who'd have a tasting room out front. Um, any kind of similar food producer that would have a retail presence out front. So the, 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 you know, the idea is that we want to bring, when people come to the farmer's market and they enjoy, they enjoy mixing and talking to people that actually produce and grow and, and bring their food to market, um, we want to give people the same experience on a different side of the food industry, which is the production side of, of things uh, like, uh, you know, it could be, it could be beverages, it could be, uh, it could be foodstuffs, it could be things like I said, like bakery. It could be a specialty uh, uh, meat, uh, meat producer. Someone in Madison, we're partnered up with someone in Madison, they make some of the best charcuterie uh, in the state of Wisconsin that's put into restaurants all over Wisconsin. So it, it, it really, this whole food thing is, has really taken off. Um, and the reason we're focused on it is because there's so many food dollars now being spent uh, uh, and dining out versus grocery stores. And, and we think that this whole cluster and these types of businesses could easily continue to expand down onto lands that are either owned or could be owned by the, by the CDA or the city um, in the future. We then want to make sure that we provide for an, an insert of public parking um, that would allow people that shop to, uh, that, sh that use the market, that patronize the farmer's market. We want to give them a field. The field is here right now on the front. Obviously, you don't want to leave parking on the main corner of the site, but we did allow for parking inside. And then this is a mixed-use building that wraps around it. It has about 11,000 square feet of, re of additional retail space in it and 75 apartments in it. Then we move to the west side of the railroad tracks, which are right here. And uh, when we brought, uh, well, we got Baum uh, Revision interested in the Kearney Trekker building, um, the challenge of, of that use is that it's, uh, it's probably the most exciting thing you could do with the building, but there needed to be some additional tax increment added because it doesn't create a whole lot of tax increments. So we came up with a concept of marrying this building right here with a second residential building over here that has 90 units in it, is got, has, it's a, it has its own parking underneath and it's some other attendant space, parking spaces here. But the idea is, is that this, this piece could then blend with this streetscape where you really starting up here, you have housing, farmer's market, housing, commercial, housing, 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 commercial. So you have this mixed use zone um, where all these different buildings create this ter terrific streetscape and tie it all together. The opportunity we think also exists to provide with obviously some laborious negotiations with the railroad but we, uh, we've been able to do it before at other sites to get crossings at rail, on rail lines. If we can get a pedestrian crossing here and leverage the parking that's associated with the uh, Kearney Trekker building, then, then you've got something where this parking and this parking feed into the two biggest traffic generators in the area, which will be this event space and the farmer's market. That you've, you've been at the farmer's market on a food truck night, you've been there kegs and kegs and curds you've been there chris kindle mart i mean these things draw lots of people and you need lots of parking to satisfy lots of people and just as what's happened in the historic third ward where they've they've been developing all the empty lots the parking lots are all being developed with buildings you got to find places for people to park um, and so um, so tying these parking uh, fields together allows you to right size and not have to overbuild these fields. And we, we think, and then that links right into one of the main entrances that they have proposed for the event space. So, so this now creates kind of a campus through here where people that experience this by, by parking here, they can go to the farmer's market, they'll, they'll get exposed to and experience these, uh, these food hall uh, or these, uh, these food cluster retailers. Um, and, they get, and then they can also get, you know, very easily park once and come over here because there's other food and beverage related uses that are going to go into um, the uh, this event space. 
Um, so that's the overall plan for the Sona site as far as how it all fits together. Now the question is, well, what is it going to be? What is it going to look like? So, um, so what I'm showing you here is a picture of uh, one part of the North End development. This particular phase was a $56 million phase of the project. Um, it includes a 30,000 square foot fresh time farmer's market store. This happened to be uh, photographed before the permanent signage went up. But I picked this photo because it shows the predominant use of a, uh, of a metal, metal panel system on the exterior of the building. And it's a kind of a shiny silverized metal panel, which to a lot of people says it speaks to uh, food, beverage. It, it reminds people of things like uh, tanks and breweries or food processing. Lots and lots of uh, buildings that are done um, in and around the food space for food tenants features a, a metal panel systems on buildings. This happens to be a Galvalume finish, so it has a really strong visual presence on the street. And we, we wrapped this $56 million building with a fair amount of this metal panel to help show off Fresh Time Farmers Market as a primary tenant. So um, uh, earlier this year, I was in Nashville and toured some of the hottest neighborhoods in Nashville, Tennessee, which is, if you're not familiar, it's the fastest growing city in the, mid, in the Midwest, um, faster than uh, Madison, faster than Des Moines. Um, and there are lots of neighborhood revitalizations going on. And I came across this one project on a tour while I was th down there for the, uh, for the Urban Land Institute conference. And this is a company called Diskin Cider. They make hard ciders. So Disc and Cider came along, they found, and I didn't have the before picture, they found this dilapidated old uh, service building that was a garage, service garage where they fixed semi-tractor trailers for semis. And the thing was, a, it was just, it was a, it was a pre-manufactured frame building, a steel frame building, and, uh, they, and, but it was, in, it was the wrong building in the right spot. And they said, hey, you know what? We're going to put some money in it. We're going to basically take the skin off, put a new skin on, and we're going to make this kind of a cool industrial space. And then we're going to open it up and we're going to have a tasting room. We're going to have an event space. And uh, this, this place is just hopping down there. Uh, and it's right in the middle of this, of this tremendous uh, revitalized neighborhood in Nashville where all this money is being reinvested. But this gave us the inspiration to look at a different building type. One of the biggest problems we've had with all of these uh, 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 prospects that we've been talking to is as soon as you put pencil to paper and you say, okay, the building's going to be 130 bucks a square foot or something, you can stop. I mean, the math is over. Uh, you know, they're going to find a, an existing restaurant someplace else. The kitchen's in, the hood's in. They'll get a little facade grant or something. They'll fix up the storefront and you're done. And they'll be in there for 50,000 bucks. That's what we're competing with. So, you, you know, we got it. We had to come up with a better mousetrap. So we began to explore this idea of using pre-engineered uh, buildings and then just putting a, a really cool skin on the building to try to get our numbers in line. So we started to look around the country. Uh, and sure enough, here we are in Seattle, Alamo Brewing in Seattle. Very simple pre-engineered metal frame buildings. It's, it's, a, it's one of the most photographed buildings now in this neighborhood of Seattle because of the way that they treated the building. This is all new construction. It's a, it, obviously, it's very strong forms, very modern looking buildings, but it, 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 it conveys a sense of, uh, and you can see over here where their beer garden is that's framed by these three buildings. Their beer garden's off to the right here. But it's a very simple building, and it's a really attractive uh, set of buildings they put together. Uh, we began to look at other buildings. This one happens to be uh, a lower technology building. This is even a steel frame building. This is literally a pole barn building, but they have framed it um, and they've, they've skinned it and they've created a exterior appearance to it that makes it feel really modern. And this really kind of tall space in here is, is the kind of space that people are acclimating to for events and for, uh, for retailing and the like. And this is really cost effective to do this. So suddenly we say, hey, now we got a building type where we can do certain things and make things look, uh, look really cool. And we can do this in a way that isn't so expensive. This is not $150 a square foot, in part because we're not 
we're not engineering the whole building from scratch. So, um, so we have found these uh, these building type, this building type, and we've been working with two major suppliers of that building type, and looking at the whole range of product that we can put together to make these buildings look like this really unique cluster on the corner of 66 and National Avenue. So, part of our strategy on uh, part of our strategy on uh, on Sona is to get these buildings to the point where they can look like the stuff that you're seeing in the images here. That we, and we can do this and we can create a very cool building for about half the cost of what we've been, what we, the, the numbers we've been burning through with probably 15 different restaurants, prospects, and you know, I don't know how many other food retailers we've, we've been involved in, but, but we just can't get the numbers to work. And the numbers don't work because new construction costs are through the roof. This is a way to combat the new construction uh, cost problem. It's a way to actually come up with cooler buildings than we could build from scratch. And it's something we're really excited about. We're seeing this in, in neighborhoods. You know, you go to Lincoln Park in Chicago, it's there. You go to Seattle, it's there. You go to Nashville, it's there. Go to any go to uh, Chelsea Market in, in Manhattan, it's there. This vocabulary is all over the place in food and beverage. So then how do we get there? How do we, how do we bring people in? We are, we're working right now with an anchor tenant that would take a little bit more than 50%, 55% of the, of the first phase. The construction costs of these buildings are low enough that we could spec the project and not worry about having to fill it. So we don't have to worry about waiting for the next guy or the next guy. And, and uh, we don't, we're gonna get one guy and go on the corner and that's it. Um, that, makes, that makes it a lot easier trying, I mean, the, the, the degree of difficulty of trying to put two restaurants together on the corner is probably a factor, I mean, you can cube that. Uh, it's probably, it's a factor of eight to try to get two restaurants to actually sit down and do it. Uh, you know, you think you've got a restaurant and then someone says, hey, we just found an old building here, we found a building there, here's a building that's getting dumped. A lot easier for us to go into that. They're, they're buying existing buildings at 20 bucks, 30 bucks a square foot. So it's just, you know, it's just not an easy space to compete in. Um, so, you know, ha half the problem is getting the pro forma to work. The other half of the problem then is how do we attract people and how do we finance them? So we've beefed up our team on this so that we, uh, we have a better channel for bringing people in on the food side. Um, John and I can go and eat at every restaurant in the metropolitan area, but that's not gonna bring anyone in. Um, what's gonna bring anyone in are the relationships within the food industry. So we have hired uh, a gentleman by the name of Kyle Cherick. Um, you may know Kyle Cherick as Wisconsin Foodie. For 11 years, he uh, produced, uh, originated, produced, and, uh, and starred on the uh, syndicated series on uh, national, on public television. Uh, and he went all around the state, talked about the food scene all around the state, uh, introduced you to restaurants and things that were going on in the, in the food space. He knows every restaurateur, every food supplier, anyone who's in the food chain in the state of Wisconsin, Kyle Cherrick knows them. And we said, why are we doing this? We're gonna hire Kyle Cherrick. <laughs> so uh, Kyle Cherrick just finally kind of burned out on his series. He's walked away from Wisconsin Foodie. He was available. We've actually done some business to them before, um, sourcing a restaurant tour for some space we had. So we said, Kyle, you're on our team here in West Dallas. We're gonna get going. He's all excited about it. He's talking to people. He's out on the street. He's working for us now to bring the, the, the food culture in. Uh, we, just, we just collectively, we just haven't done it. I mean, we haven't, brought, we haven't brought anyone in. So that's one half the problem. So we can bring a lot of people in. The second half of the problem is a lot of people in the food industry have really great ideas. They got great recipes. They can, they can work magic in the kitchen. They have no idea what a balance sheet or a P&L statement is, and they, can't, they just can't do it. They can't bring it in. So we said, okay, we need to find someone who actually knows how to talk numbers with these guys and, and who can help them and, and who's a real, a real resource in helping people make sense out of, out, of, out of making this kind of a capital investment. So the second guy we brought in to our team now is Mike Harrigan, who um, John is someone that John knows well. Um, he's with a group called Wisconsin Economic Development Association. He happens to be familiar with uh, West Dallas because he just helped Capri get their financing over there. He helped, he helped source a broader base of options for uh, Capri to look at so they could capitalize their deal on Greenfield Avenue. 
So um, what, what Mike Harrigan does, he's retired from Ellers Associates, one of the largest uh, municipal uh, fi finance advisors in the state. Um, and, uh, and through his work that he's doing now with uh, Wisconsin Economic Development Association, uh, he, he is helping banks, uh, he's helping put together banks that need to make investments in CRA qualified uh, census tracts and businesses that are locating there. Capri is a perfect example where he brought four different banks, uh, four different banks to the table. I think John was four banks is what he told what he told me, but he brought four different so that so that Capri could look at different opportunities for different financing with different banks. So he acts as kind of in a broker capacity, but it's invaluable because the owner of Capri said, "I'm with such and such bank right now. They're really not paying attention to me. You know what else can I do?" So. So someone like Mike Harrigan has resources beyond, you know, normal and customary and understands because of his uh, past professional practice, but also because of his affiliation with, uh, with WIDA, that he can, he can bring in banks that need to make investments in, C in CRA qualified census tracts. You know, we're, I mean, the mother load of this project, you know, we're CRA, uh, 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 you know, we're optimized for CRA related investments that banks have to make. To maintain their charters and, and the like, um, we have opportunity zone designation, which we've already used once to attract equity uh, as part of our uh, as part of the uh, investment that we've already made here. Um, you know, new markets tax credits. Um, the challenge on new markets tax credits has always been the timing of the credits and and when a fire, for instance, would have to get them out. So we've actually opened up a second channel uh, with uh, First Pathways to talk to them about. New Marcus tax credits. They happen to have a specialty in food and beverage that they've developed. So, um, so if it doesn't work out with fire for whatever reason, we have a second source of New Marcus tax credits now. And then we've always got to get through the development agreement and the and uh, and the like. Um, but that's kind of the that's kind of doing business. That's that's you know hopefully um, hopefully now that we've been through it twice already on Aurora and on the housing. Hopefully we have a easier time doing the third one. So. Um, so we feel like we've got a lot of momentum here. We th feel it's going in the right direction, um, that we have actually an outcome that provides a substantially higher assessed value uh, in investment than what was originally envisioned. Um, act and you know, and, uh, and uh, we think that what's been invested already has helped leverage um, uh, what I think is gonna be some really exciting reinvestment in the Kearney and Trekker block. Um, and I think this thing's just gonna take off at this point. Um, you know, we have one hurdle to get over, which is getting the first guys across the line um, uh, on the food and beverage. And if you've ever worked with anyone, if small proprietors in food and beverage, they, you know, everybody, they're, they're not easy. They're, these, are, these, are not, these, these are not people that uh, are, are, you know, methodical in terms of their, of their decision making. So the first deal might be a little bit of a lost leader for us, but we're, we, I hate to use the term, we're gonna make it up on volume, but we think we will make it up. Uh, and uh, it's, you know, again, that first piece is not that, I mean, it's a six to $7 million investment. This is more of a chip shot. We just financed a $37 million housing project here. So, uh, you know, this is not, uh, we've got momentum. We wanna continue to move forward. We wanna get this thing done. And when you really look at it, uh, you know, ironically, uh, it's not that far off schedule. It's rearranged. The parts and pieces are redone. But when you think about what's happened in the market and you understand that people a lot smarter than all of us in food and beverage, if Sendix came in and made a $20 million investment and lost their shirt on it, you know, it's, I mean, there are a lot of people that have miscalculated this food and beverage business in Milwaukee. Um, we want to get this thing right because it reflects on the farmer's market. Uh, we think the market is right, and we think we now have some additional resources to help bolster our team. Uh, you know, I kind of feel like we got some mid, some mid, uh, mid-season roster changes here. We've been allowed <laughs> to expand the roster to 40, uh, off of 25. Now we can add to our pitching staff. We can add some utility players, and I think that these two ads are going to be huge for us going forward. I concur with what Bob has been saying. Uh, uh, Particularly the style of building, I think, to refocus on who we want to attract and how we want to attract them and what price point 
they can afford. We were always way over all of their price points. I think some prospects that Bob's working with are the kind of entities that we'd like to have in West Dallas and that would fare well in that environment. Uh, the key is getting them to say yes. Uh, where are you at, by the way, in that that Sona part one? Well, the first so the first user who's our key, our key user, um, is um, uh, you know they're they're they have their financials together now for us. Um, they're 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 working on their capitalization plan and on how they're going to actually capitalize this. They're looking at a few of their options with their attorney right now on that, but. They're, you know, they're they're close. We could, I mean, we could hear from them tomorrow. We could hear from them next Monday. We, they're working on it continuously. They have to figure what they're trying to figure out right now is how do they capitalize their expansion? Because this business, the business is moving and growing, and they need about they're, they're looking at somewhere in the range of a million dollars of expansion capital. They um, they happen to they happen to get into a really bad retail deal. Um, that is kind of hamstrung them uh, for the last uh, uh, 18 months or so, but they're starting to see their way out of that. So there are there are probably seven or eight moving parts to the decision. We've actually offered to provide venture capital uh, on the investment side to them as well, um, separate of the real estate transaction. We think the business, this lead business, it's a Milwaukee known brand. For them to move to West Dallas would be a it just be a home run to get them here, so we're we're we've been we've been working them along, um, and we know you know we we know that there's uh, timing related to um, to dedicating the credits and we've told them that, um, but we're we're talking to them regularly and we think uh, we, they want to do the deal they're just you got to get them to jump off the cliff with us, you know it's. For small business people, it's it's a little bit of a they're 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 working through it. But they're I mean they you know they came to us. We didn't go to them initially. Um, you know we've been working with their entire team on this for a while, on both the investment side as well as on the real estate side. Um, uh, you know we engaged we've engaged their builder who they had been working with to look to put a building on a freestanding site. Um, their builder has since brought us another 20,000 square foot prospect, um, which we're, we haven't qualified yet, but we're, you know, we're interested in it. I mean, these guys that are in this type of building business that put up these buildings, uh, that these, these pre-engineered buildings, you know, they, they, they have their own, spe they have their own specialties. One of the, so we're, we're competitively talking to two different builders. One of them happens to have a huge presence in the food business. Now, not every food related business is going to be appropriate because if they don't we don't want to have people just manufacturing down here we want people to have a retail presence we want to have that interaction but um, but there are there are a lot of people out there looking for something and you know West Dallas offers them an incredible opportunity I mean it's you know we, we can produce this space for them uh, a lot more cost effectively than them going out and buying a piece of property in some business park I, I mean, also it, think Mandel is got to help this evolve quicker by finally coming to the conclusion that a lot of these restaurateurs can't afford to build the building. And so they're going to build everything out for them. And that's, I think, is going to help this move, move this thing forward. So I think the, the potential is much, much has improved well, to be able to get this phase started. The problem with restaurants, you can't, you cannot spec build a restaurant. You can't do it. You know, you can barely get your own kitchen remodeled given, you know, your wife's in, input, right? I mean, this is hard stuff to do. Restaurateurs say, everything's got to be exactly the way I want it or I don't want the restaurant space. So we can't just go out there and throw up 10,000 square feet for a couple of restaurants and ask them to come. It just doesn't work that way. Uh, you know, uh, for the type of space that we're talking about and the type of businesses we're talking about, it does work that way. The space is a lot more fungible. And the building type is a lot more flexible. So depending upon where we put a panel of glass, a huge glass overhead door, uh, you know, how we, how we set up the building, it's a very flexible building. And suddenly you can say, yeah, we can make that adjustment. We can make that adjustment. And things, people can fit in there a lot easier 
than the alternative. And we just think that the, that the collection of buildings is going to end up looking so cool at the end of the day, people are going to want to be here. Um, and uh, it's, just, it's just, I mean, we are like, you know, we're like off the charts excited about it. And, uh, you know, some, at some point along the way, you got to have some reality in the business. The reality of this is that we got to get, you know, we got to get this first guy signed. We may not make any money on the first guy, but that first guy is going to be so important for us, you know, it'll trigger the rest of the space. Hopefully, that other land that kind of comes down along 66, there's a lot more acreage on that block that isn't planned yet. So, and some of it's actually on the space that we had planned initially. So we haven't even planned all the space out that we were initially offered. So there's there's all sorts of additional opportunity to leverage up here, and uh, we just we just got to get it going. I mean, it's no different than what we did north of National Avenue. We just had to get it going. We had to get our foot in the ground. And in that case, you know, we, we had to get Aurora set because we did not want to lose the Aurora deal. We could not start the housing until we had Aurora set and knew what they wanted. Uh, we would have just, you know, to lose Aurora from the community would have been a really dumb thing for all of us. I mean, um, and they built a state-of-the-art facility to boot. So, um so we're, we're happy with where we're at. We're happy with the money we've invested. We're looking forward to investing more money. Uh, we think we've got a really great scheme for Sona. It's taken a lot of time for all of us to kind of fess up on, hey, this idea of trying to get restaurants is not gonna work as a lead. Um, and when the entire, you know, when the entire grocery business basically shut down uh, back in 2016, 2017, that, that that kind of the dominoes fall and all the co-tenancy agreements go away when you don't have the traffic generator. So, um, uh, you know, groceries aren't expanding right now. Um, we're not we're not holding out any hope for that um, at this point, and that's okay. That's okay. We're going to go across the street. We're going to talk to NDC. We're going to see if they can leverage up um, the grocery that they have across. There's a grocery there. It's pick and save. They put a little bit of money into it. We like to see them put a lot more money into it. So, um, you know, there's other stuff that that uh, that can happen in the immediate area. But now we're talking about having a collection of 330 apartments instead of just 177. You add that to the 196 across the street from us. Now you've got some density. Now you've got some rooftops to really support the businesses and the restaurants that are in the area. Um, and that's what this area needs. It needs the rest. It needs the rooftops. It needs the housing. It needs the population density. And it also then needs something to do. And the something to do is either over here on Greenfield Avenue or it's right at the corner. It's at the farmer's market. The farmer's market, the you know, food truck night last, was it last Friday was food truck night. Um, tons of people come out. You know, it's, it's just, we can get people there and you can make this a really exciting space. We just gotta, we gotta finish this out now. Thank you, Bob. Uh, yeah. Any questions? Mr. Clark. Bob, you paint with a broad brush, which I would expect you to, and uh, you're always <laughs> enthusiastic, which I would expect. The smallest component of the entire project is the kiosk, and that was going to be done quickly, and it's, nothing's happened. It's just small, and I wonder why well, you haven't moved that well, forward. Well, quite frankly, I'm glad we didn't, because the kiosk is... To also answer your question, Mark Lutz was going to do yeah. that kiosk. We have, we have a letter of intent with Mark. And the then kiosk. he went and did a bunch of other stuff in West Dallas. So yeah. I'm fine. I'm good with that. Oh, if he if, if Mark doesn't, I mean, we have a we have a letter of intent on file with Mark. If he doesn't come for this, this kiosk is not going to be a problem. But the problem, the the challenge of that kiosk, the original kiosk building that was designed there, three hundred seventy five dollars a square foot mm -hmm. for a kiosk. Now what we're going to do is we're going to take this building style and, of course, this. here we go. The building style that we're, uh, this building style, we're now, we now have the building here redesigned in that same style so it all fits together and so it all looks alike, you know, that it creates a theme there. So if we would have built, the, the least significant part of the project, you know, that we, we, I mean, we can't even finance that. You know, that's just, that's an off balance sheet. That's a cash investment. 
be awful. We can't cool. do a new. We can't do a new markets tax credit deal. It's too small. You can't do. You know. You can't do that. It's just not going to work under any of the normal and and uh, and customary ways. So we also told Bob to focus on the big stuff. That's a little project. It's not going to make or break the uh, the big project. But let's get the big project going. Yeah. But that's. You know, if someone would have said, if someone had said the kiosk is the most important building, get it done right away, you know, we would have pushed it, but we were going to be pushing a string a little bit at $375 a square foot. So we would have been spending a lot of time grinding away at redesigning that building. We may end up designing a building that just doesn't fit with anything else we have planned on. Any other questions? We'll talk about more of this in closed session, but uh, Bob. Thank you very much for great. Thank you for having us. Thank you. Appreciate your time. Sounds exciting. Yeah. We go to item number three: discussion relative to properties located at 106, 100 and 106, 20 West Greenfield Avenue, former Burger King. Mr. Thank Steve you, Mr. Well. Chairman. Uh, yeah. you want to get there, Sean? The problem that we've had with Burger King is that the owner of the land underneath the building is separate from Burger King who owns the building, and the Burger King owns the lot to the west. Uh, and we've been trying to get people involved to try to redevelop that property, and they can never get all the parties on the same page at the same time. Uh, the land on that lot is now for sale for about $400,000. And Burger King still has a lease on that for another four years. Uh, and we'll get into that more into closed session as to how we might be able to help catalyze the, push this thing forward. Everybody satisfied to wait to closed session on that item? Yeah. We'll go to item number four. Resolution amending professional service contract with Concord Group TCG in the amount of not to exceed $20,000 for advisory service related to tax of tax increment district number 17, City of West Dallas, Lincoln Avenue, West Corridor. Mr. Stiebel. <laughs> second. Then move for approval of second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Resolution passes. Item number six, discussion relative. Uh, uh, five. Oh, or five, excuse me. Item five, discussion relative to Lincoln Avenue Corner Tax Increment District number 17. Mr. Uh, Stiebel. Mr. Chair, the Joint Review Board uh, approved the uh, the TIF district this afternoon, uh, or this morning, late this morning. Uh, so that TIF is officially created once we send the communication to the Common Council. Uh, and we'll talk about more of this in closed session, but the TIF district was generally about what we had initially proposed. Uh, we've added uh, the developer wanted 1.45 million, uh, and that was a, a, we had determined through our consultants uh, that it was a correct amount. We added the interest that he's got to pay for during the time period, because this is a pay-go, so he has to borrow that money uh, from a bank to be able to, to finance that, so we added that in there. We also uh, changed the base value of the project Instead of using 2018 values, we're using 2019 values. So we put the upper number, in, the upper numbers in there. What that does is that it increases the base value, which all the underlying taxing jurisdictions continue to get taxes off of. And it's the increment of what's above that it what goes to the development. So the, all the taxing jurisdictions will benefit from that move. And we're still projecting it to be closing out in seven years. And we'll talk about more about that in the closed session. Seven. 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 We'll go to item number six then. Resolution authorizes the executive director to enter into a letter of intent and agreement with Baum Revisions LLC group for property located at 6771 West National Avenue, potentially portions of 6700 West Mitchell Street. That's all you need to do. You don't need to put okay. the tax numbers. <laughs> Second. Been moved for approval and second. Is there any further discussion? Mr. Chairman. Mr. Stevel. Uh, Sean, if you want to make a few brief comments, I want to, we want to, then we'll talk about this in the closed session. Sure. Um, yeah, this is uh, progressing nicely. Um, 
as you can see, they've sort of uh, started their uh, due diligence phase. Uh, this is just a picture of them out there on uh, last Thursday. Uh, they had their architect, structural engineer, uh, energy envelope person. They had they had their whole crew out there, their marketing people, um, uh, and uh, they they went through the building in detail for for hours. Um, and so it's it's nice to see how enthusiastic they are um, to have their whole team out there. They had their event space person, um, uh, you know, sort of f figuring out where things things may go and things of that nature. And, so they're tightening up their numbers, um, looking at all the details, and uh, so that's good to see. Um, again, a review of it. We've all seen the space, the event space, and the, the various uh, commercial users, uh, brewery, and other food producers uh, throughout. Um, you know, the LOI, just briefly, it just goes through the, the generalities that we've already talked about. Uh, you know, the purchase pr general purchase price, uh, Form of assistance uh, that you know they'd be looking for new market tax credits, 11 to 12 million. Uh, this is a, a big part of the funding source, and this is the uh, historic uh, the tax credits. And so, as part of that, they have to go through a, a rigorous uh, architecture review process uh, that looks at a lot of details. So, that's built into the into the LOI, sort of how that's all going to work out. Um, you know, the state's going to want us to remove the panels sooner rather than later. They're going to try to. They're trying to sort of get the state to to, to hold off on that because uh, they're protecting this historic building, and so there's sort of a negotiation that's that's happening. And so, working out those details, uh, you know, environmental um, uh, details uh, are being uh, sorted out as well. Um, shared parking, uh, they're they're working, they're trying to figure out, you know, how exactly how much parking they're going to need and and how that's going to work and how that would be financed. Um, and so 90 days is, is what the LOI is set up for. Um, we can certainly talk about more of that in, in closed session. You want to finish the Thank vote? Thank you, Sean. Then? You can finish the vote. Uh, we might, we'd like to go to closed session to before talk about we some vote on it. Before we oh, okay. adopt it. We can come Thank back you. and adopt we'll it. We'll hold that. Uh, let's see, we go to item seven discussion relative to the property located. At 1323 South 65th Street, former Motor Castings Company. Mr. Stevo. The last CDA meeting, the CDA asked that the department take a look at that building to see what potential reuse options are there for it. Uh, Patrick and I toured that building, and as you can, this is probably the best photo example of that. Hmm. It's, uh, lots of low ceilings. Uh, that, that, there's not a lot that you can really do with that. There is one building there that is reusable to the very south part that that Motor Cousins bought about eight, nine, ten years ago. That building is really neat. It could be reused. The rest of it, I'm not even sure a cold storage person could possibly use that building. I, the only thing I could see for it is demolition, and that's kind of what we're looking for is what options are in there, uh, and we're currently exploring what kind of multifamily could go in there or what are the reuse options are for that land mass along with the broker who showed it to several people and they're all trying to figure out what they can do with it. And so the, the short answer is we don't know, but it's demolition is probably in its future. Mr. Clark. John, is that uh, property being marketed? Yes. And by whom? Uh, is it Collier's? I believe so. Yeah. yeah. And they've taken three or four people through it, but they haven't gotten any offers on it or that we know of yet. But it probably cost about $800,000 just to demolish the building. They probably won't be out for a while. They say winter months are the best months of the year to do industrial sales. And so the company that bought motor castings has taken out all the equipment that they need. And so they'll have a sale of whatever equipment's left sometime in this winter, so it probably won't be available uh, for disposition until after the first of the year. It's been what is the city doing to advance the sale? Or are we staying doing? out of their way. Pardon me? Staying out of their way. Okay. It's been listed for probably two to three months. Uh, it's been out there. Where, where is the company that bought them? Where are they located? Ohio. Ohio? Or, or Indiana, maybe. Indiana? Indiana. I think it's Indiana. Hmm. Okay, thank you. 
No further. Uh, okay, we go to item eight. Discussion relative to the redevelopment of Chris Hansen's Incorporated in the area of 92nd Street and Lapin Avenue. Mr. Steve. Uh, as you're all well aware, uh, Chris Hansen has bought back a lot of the properties that they've sold away. Uh, so they made a previous decision not to expand here eight years ago. Now they bought them all back and demolished them. And then I'd like to go to a closed session and talk about how we might induce them to make substantial reinvestments into West Dallas. All right, now we want to go into closed session? According to our agenda. Uh, we can go through the, the rest of the items that come back. Okay, E, consider relative report on redevelopment initiatives. Uh, Sean, if you'd like to go through those that you pulled up. Yep. Right quickly. Six, uh, six points development. Uh, the yellow panels have uh, started to go up on the uh, on the uh, Mandel residential uh, developments. Uh, just a noteworthy thing. Uh, <laughs> yes. Uh, 6610 West Greenfield Avenue. Uh, Chris Pauls is in his due diligence stage of that. As you know, as you may, may recall, we had we have an LOI. Uh, uh, with Mr. Paul, uh, he, there, he's been going in there with various contractors and looking at all the details and tightening up the numbers, working with his bank uh, as part of the whole overall process is refinancing uh, at Capri. And so it's all working out well so far. And so fingers crossed that that continues to go well. Um, uh, I have no, no real update on, on this uh, other than it's uh, we haven't heard of any. The brick is starting to go up on the building, um, and things seem to be going smoothly out at uh, Element 84. Just for a quick comment, the Mandel project will be open for apartment this fall. Uh, Element 84 will probably be in January to start leasing. Uh, Teledyne, uh, is down here, I'm not sure. You nothing know, to report. You know, we're, the, the, nothing to report. Nothing to report on Teledyne. Uh, 70th and Washington. Uh, 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 cobalt development came in and, and, and maybe looking to sort of uh, move things around on their proposal. Um, um, previously, as you may recall, that the hotel, the home to suites, was proposed for at the corner of 70th and Washington. They may now, you know, move that uh, further south. Uh, that would allow for them to sort of market uh, a corner for a, a retail or a, they're talking about a, a, a grocer uh, that may be looking in the small area. Small grocer. A very small one. Um, and um, and so they're, they're, they've been looking at, you know, the possibility of just kind of moving things around. Uh, we don't view it as a, as a bad thing. It's just They're just trying to take advantage of the corner of the piece they have, and it gets the hotel actually a little bit closer to the downtown, makes the downtown a little bit more walkable uh, sensibly for, you know, people that might be staying there so, you know, they can visually see it. Um, and uh, so this is just how it would build out. So they'd have, you know, commercial on the first floor, so take advantage of the corner that they have, and they just stack the, the office on top of it. So that's just how that lays out. Parking structure and back, and uh, sort of in between uh, them and some place where the parking lot currently is. It's a concept. Uh, at this point, it would have to go through plan commission approvals and things of that nature. And uh, CDA approval, ultimately common council approval, but that just, we're not surprised that they, all these developments evolve as they go through, so we've got surprised. All looks hey, well. Sean, go back to that last one. Sure. Really. Thank you. Please. Thank you. Okay. Yeah, this was a proposal, one of the very early proposals. Uh, let me bother the boss, if you would. Uh, this area down in here, they talk about buying the shopping center, which is not going to happen. Uh, but this is the school administration building over here, and this is what is referred to as the CTE building if they want to build that or not and we'll be we'll be talking with that later as we get into close session as to what the park how the role of the park will be involved in the rest of the development uh, 6th and Beloit uh, 60th and Burnham is the uh, site of our uh, better block uh, project uh, it uh, we had a you know kickoff event with the neighborhood uh, uh, a month or so ago and that was well attended it, 60 70 people there from the neighborhood and now the big event takes place on the 6th and 7th um, it's uh, meant to be a community build where people will be out there painting bike lanes building parklets um, there'll be a pop-up uh, vendors there uh, food trucks we're gonna have a few bands there um, it's it's a way to sort of get the neighborhood together get people talking together 
um, and uh, just show how different areas can be used, uh, I guess, differently, how uh, underutilized areas, you could take advantage of them. So it's just sort of a, a quick two-day thing to show all oh, that, that vacant space can be used, you know, like this. Uh, you know, you have a little coffee shop in it or uh, that, that gravel parking lot. Oh, you, could, you could have a little playground there and you could get a food truck there and, you know, tables and things like that. So it's sort of meant to just show how quickly, how sh show how spaces can change for the better. And it gets, it's also a way just to get the neighborhood out uh, together. The key point of this is to get, get, help the neighborhood get re-engaged with their own neighborhood to help guide its future, help make suggestions as how they want it to evolve. That's what we want is the neighborhood input, the neighborhood driving force. And so one of the things you see here is, uh, are, you know, a different way to do bike lanes or the bike lanes, you know, on the inside of the, of the parking. Um, it's actually the more uh, accepted way to do it. Uh, it's just not been done much in the, in the region. Um, and uh, so if it's a temporary, this is a sort of more of a temporary kind of paint. So it's a way to show, quickly show how something can be done and, um, in a different way. And it's a good, and the community gets to actually, you know, literally paint the bike lane, and so gets physically be involved in changing their landscape. Uh, the mural uh, mural program. Um, I don't think that's actually. I apologize. No. Let's skip that one. We're done. Um, High one hundred corridor. Uh, just an update. There was a, a major transaction that took place uh, late last week. Um, the pick and save, uh, Coles, Marshalls, shopping center along with the Walgreens, uh, and I believe it's the uh, one other outlet out there sold uh, to a developer out of uh, Tennessee. Uh, I just want to make a quick point here that uh, Sean and Patrick had met with the same developer uh, about, they came to look at the Town Center Shopping Center because it was in an opportunity zone. These guys sold West Dallas so much that these guys came back and uh, well, that deal fell apart. They put an offer to buy it and it fell apart. They came back and bought another shopping center, another $70 million investment in West Dallas. So we're pretty happy about that. So it's a, a major transaction. We're really excited. They're, they, you know, they, they're, they're looking at, you know, redoing the facade of the building, uh, maybe adding some other uses. Um, and so they're actually, they're coming in um, uh, in a week to uh, talk about their future plans for the site. So that's a big one. Um, Hunter and Corridor, Corridor Study. Uh, it's uh, it's beginning. We're just, we've begun the uh, to schedule our shareholder focus groups. Uh, we've got 15 participants scheduled. Uh, those are going to take place on September 5th and 6th, and sort of that's sort of the first stage of that high 100 study process is to get some input from uh, various you know from realtors, from property owners, council members, uh, things of that nature. You know, people people in different areas to see what's their view of high 100. What would they like to see change? And, Got that underway. Is there any update on the uh, DOT projects? It's yeah, that's. Um, yeah, they are going to proceed. Uh, with well, the resurfacing. With the, right, with just the resurfacing, and so it's, next year. And uh, yeah, the plan is 2020 as as of now, right? Mm -hmm. I, for the resurfacing. With resurfacing. Yeah. I think they, I thought they said it was 20, 2021, but it could possibly depending on state financing may may move it up to 2020. Is what I heard. Jason's right. We were at the same thing. <laughs> he listened better than I did. Yeah. Pete told me 2020, so I'm going to that. <laughs> and then the last one, Sean? Uh, Beecher Street Corridor. Um, uh, just a quick update. The, the, if you've been around, that you'd see that this trellis is actually up in front of the building now. Uh, they're actually hoping to be open by this Friday, you know, fingers crossed. Uh, so. Um, that's a it's a beer garden called uh, Station Number Six. Uh, Mark Lutz, uh, you know, basically purchased the old uh, auto repair facility and is uh, has remodeled it, and uh, so pretty exciting. What are we calling it now? Lutz. Lutz Way Lutz. Lutz Lane. Lutz Lane. <laughs> <laughs> Can anyone tell us the significance of the name Station Number Six? Does anyone know that? Because I don't know. I don't. Give me a call second. Mark Lutz. Think of one. <laughs> yeah. Six properties. Why? I. How many fire stations do we have? We have three, three. and yeah, it's uh, it's near station number two. Okay. Yeah. 
We don't know why. Yeah, yeah. We'll, we'll ask him though. We'll, we'll have it for you at the next meeting. Thank you. Get on that. Appreciate it. Mr. Chairman, uh, that is all we have. If I could go to uh, your second, I think. Mr. Clark. The 116th of Morgan Initiative has fallen in its favor. Why is that? And what's the status? I, it's not on the agenda. That was our fault. I'll talk to you about it later, effectively telling you that the environmental consultant will start in the middle of September. The environmental consultant will start in September. All right, we put it back on the agenda. We'll be old next month. And then on the Highway 100 corridor, the Walgreens at Highway 100 in Greenfield, which is closed. They closed because of the traffic pattern. Yes. What is going to happen to that building? We are talking with the real estate brokers now about what could possibly be done. And if we did follow up, we'd have to go into closed session to talk more about that. Okay. Okay. Can I have a motion to go into closed session, please? So moved. Second. Been moved and second. You take roll call, please. Uh, Wayne Clark. Yes. Yes. Yes.